You're in the Business Insurance Zone with me, Steve Savant, National Financial Columnist and Financial Color Commentator. This week on The Biz, the Asset Protection Series on today's show, Introduction into Asset Protection with National Columnist and Attorney at Law, Ike Devji. When it comes to life insurance, annuities, long-term care, disability, or group pension plans, we're the news you can use. Well, welcome everyone to the Business Insurance Zone. I'm your host, Steve Savant, and we're broadcasting live to a nationwide audience of financial advisors right here in Fountain Hills, Arizona, home of America's largest fountain. And with me today, special guest, Ike Devji. Well, welcome to the show, Ike. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate you being here. I mean, you are a national columnist on all that is asset protection, but you also do a lot of good work in front end personal wills. We're talking about the advantages of durable power of attorney, basic trust work. You know, we, we like that. We need. We want to make sure all our consumers understand what's out there and what it can do for you. And when I think about you being an attorney on top of this, you're, you're very articulate in your articles, and I even get it on the first pass. So it must be pretty good, pretty, pretty good writing on your part. I want to talk to you and get into something right away because I probably get email, especially on this one subject, not so much on the wills, not so much on the trust, but on health care directives. How important is it? to already tell your beneficiaries or actually select a directive, a director for your health care in case something happens and you can't do it? Well, Steve, it's a great question and I think it's very important. Uh, there are things that we plan against that many times are in the realm of possibility. This is one of those things that for almost all of us is, is a certainty at some point in mm -hmm. our life. We are going to be at a point, um, whether it's in the future, or sooner than we expect, where we're going to need medical care, where we're going to need help, where we are going to want those decisions known in a clear and predictable way. And uh, this is the responsible way to do it. It protects you and it protects those you love as well in a, in a time where they're already under a lot of stress. Now, do you attach this to a regular will or is this part of a living trust? What, what document? Is it standalone or is it actually attached to one of those two documents? That's, that's an important issue. It can be done either way. Uh, in some cases, we will see it executed uh, a little bit later than we like when somebody goes into a hospital or right before medical care is delivered. If somebody is, for instance, having scheduled surgery and they don't have these issues addressed, they'll do that. In other cases, ideally, we'll have done it beforehand mm. where the client has had the ability to put some time and thought into it and have those important discussions with the family members who are going to be there to help them through it. So what I'm thinking, and I've always thought, and maybe erroneously, I've always thought that this is kind of part of the living will. You know, you're kind of really expressing your, your last days, your kind of end of life planning. So if I'm thinking about this, should it be a relative or should it be somebody completely dispassionate? I think that varies from family to family. One of the landmark cases that everybody in the country is familiar with is the tragedy in Florida that happened with Terry Schiavo. Oh. Mm. And the extended suffering that she and her family members went through, the expense, uh, the national media attention, the court costs, the mm. legal fees, could have been avoided with a little bit of forethought. Um, and so really it's gotta be an individual decision that's based on who do you have around you is that person going to be able to follow your wishes as opposed to follow the perhaps uh, emotional mm -hmm. and personal ties that they have? Can somebody close to you make those decisions in that objective way? Mm -hmm. If you don't feel that you have that person in your family or that the emotional issues may control, you may want to look at a third party. Well, what about a basic will? Now, I, everybody knows we should have a will. Give me the basic characteristics of a simple will that everybody can do because it's not that I don't think it's that expensive to have an attorney draw it up so talk a little bit about a basic will. That's that's a great point a, a basic will is a very affordable tool um, it does provide a great deal of surety in terms of being able to give specific parts of your estate or specific assets to specific people um, and I think that everybody should know that whether your state is a state that has a good probate process or a bad probate mm. process, controlling the disposition of everything you've, you're going to leave behind through a, at least a will 
is always a better alternative than the expense and delay mm -hmm. and additional stress of the probate process. Okay, so when I'm, I'm putting together a will, give me a couple basic characteristics that I need to have in my will. Well, number one, it's got to be executed when you have the capacity mm. to execute it. So many times what we see is that people don't execute a will until they are facing some kind of duress or emergency. Um, it could be that someone is struck with an illness or is going in for a serious surgery uh, or is incapacitated mm. in an accident. And at that point, somebody comes in at the last minute with a sheaf of papers. And if we have a, con a question of whether mm -hmm. that person had the legal, mental, physical capacity to execute that, um, that weakens what we're trying to achieve. That can really cause a, um, a heartbreak in a family. It can cause a heartbreak. It can cause mm -hmm. disputes that are expensive. Mm -hmm. So the first one is really a timing issue mm -hmm. right, when we're talking about capacity. The second one is that it's got to be um, legally enforceable. Every state has a very specific set of guidelines that control how a will is drafted, mm -hmm. how it must be witnessed and proved up to be legitimate. And those are the two most basic things that we look at, is did the person have capacity mm -hmm. and did it comply with the laws of the state in order to make it enforceable? Mm -hmm. Those are two critical pieces that you want to be able to input into your will. And when we come back from the break, we're going to talk more about some of the other issues, beneficiaries, who gets what, and all these things that sometimes can cause huge family disagreements and heartache. We're going to try to map that out and put it on a very easy to understand segment. And when we come back from the break, we're going to continue our introduction into asset protection in our asset protection series with Ike Devji. And don't forget to enroll in IULUniversity.com for the best training, education, and sales support when it comes to life insurance for retirement income. You're listening to the insurance industry's number one resource for products, planning ideas, carrier information, and interviews you can use. When it comes to life insurance, annuities, long-term care, disability, or group pension plans, we're the news you can use. Well, welcome back to the Business Insurance Zone. I'm Steve Savant with Ike Devji. And remember, you can sign up and order today's support materials at our website at thebiz.tv. And just a heads up, before moving forward with any of the ideas on the show, always consult your attorney and tax advisor, and if you're FINRA licensed, your broker-dealer compliance officer. And we're introducing you to asset protection strategies in our asset protection series. I'm with attorney and national author. Ike Devji, and he's talking about wills and trusts and things like that. Well, we haven't got really into trust yet, but let's talk about the will. I, I want to talk about guardianship for minor children. That seems to be a hot issue, and especially with not only traditional families, but also with blended families. Talk a little bit about that, because that's an important issue. It's a very important issue, Steve. You're correct. The decision of as to who is going to have the primary legal responsibility to care for your children who are under the age of 18 or to control assets on their behalf is one of the most essential and important reasons to do any kind of estate planning. And in fact, when we talk about estate planning and asset protection, most people's most valued asset is their children. At the end of the day, it's the thing they care about the most. So making those decisions beforehand mm. and having perhaps the conversation with the person who you would uh, delegate or nominate to be in that position mm -hmm. is a indispensable part of any company now, now in the state They plan. need to accept that responsibility, right? You just can't tag somebody to do that. I mean, you have to actually say, are you willing to take care of my children and their finance and education if something happens to me? Legally, you can name anyone you want. I think ethically and responsibility, and, and uh, from, a, from an ethical sense and from a sense of responsibility, it is more appropriate mm -hmm. to have that conversation and not surprise somebody with that responsibility. Now, I, I noticed, I thought I heard you a little in your, in your voice there a bit about if I, have a, if I have children that I'm not really sure are ready to receive assets, 
can I dictate from the grave, so to speak, what they can and cannot do and what they can get access to? Not only can you, you should. Uh, I think everyone who's watching knows someone, perhaps that they met in college or mm -hmm. later in life, who got a large sum of money from an estate. And there are some people who make uh, productive use of that, but I would say that giving most 18 to 22 year olds a large lump sum of cash is not productive in most cases. So yes, that is part of the planning. Mm -hmm. It's an important part of the planning. You can control uh, what they get, how they get it, when they get it. We typically see provisions, for instance, that might stagger the distribution mm -hmm. of an estate at 21, 25, and 30, mm. as one example, in equal thirds. Um, the trustee of the estate will have the ability to advance funds for things that are important to both the grantor, the person who created the trust, and the mm -hmm. beneficiaries, the pre people who are left well, behind. Well, I just heard you say another thing then. So it's important to choose the executor uh, whoever's going to be the executor of the trust is important to choose that person because he's going to have to execute and maybe actually be a firewall to this young man who wants to spend you know money right now and it's already written out he has to make sure that will is executed exactly the way it was intended that's absolutely correct that person is in essence especially for minor children not only a guardian let's assume it's the same person oh, so and it, it doesn't be, have to be. be it doesn't have to be okay absolutely that person is a guardian not only of the physical being of the child, but of the assets that you mm -hmm. left to care for the child. And so there is a certain amount of legal paperwork and financial acumen and things that need to be addressed. What if I make a bequest outside my family? Is that an issue? I mean, I have individuals that maybe I want to do something for. They're not really blood relatives. They're just people I want to be able to put in my will. Is there any really difference between my blood family and how they are as my beneficiaries and you know, making a bequest to individuals who are not related to me? I think that if you have that intent, and many of the people that we work with do, they mm -hmm. have a, a friend or a business partner, and many times a bequest um, is not just the transfer of a lump sum of cash, or some cash equivalent asset, it might be a physical item, a piece of personal property mm. of great significant value. Mm. Um, we recently worked with a client who uh, is transferring his prize collection of hunting rifles to his best friends, the, the best friend that he has hunted with for the last 30 years. Um, so that is one example of you know, a specific item of personal mm -hmm. property. But yes, I think it's a good idea to memorialize that, mm -hmm. especially in an age where we have increased estate litigation, where the people you leave behind who are in your direct family, absent that very specific writing and intent, mm -hmm. may object to that transfer. Now, I, I'm just, with, with what time we have left, how important is it to discuss this with your children and your, because those are your, basically your beneficiaries, how important is it to get this on the table? I think it's important, but I also realize that it's a very difficult conversation for mm. people to have. Um, you know the kind of people that we work with. Many of them are very affluent, very successful. Sometimes the estates are average, middle class, upper middle class families. Sometimes they are extraordinary. Um, in both cases, there's always a hesitation to give people an anticipation. Um, but in an ideal world, you would let people know that you had some specific intents, that there were some wishes that you'd expressed and wanted followed, mm. and maybe even some detail on what those wishes actually are. Well, when we're thinking about constructing a will, we're gonna talk about in the next segment, some of the components to prepare you for your first meeting with an attorney. I mean, many people, this will be their first opportunity to sit down with an attorney and really map out their heart, their will, their desires, things that they wanna transfer to the next generation or to individuals as we discussed. And remember, you can watch this show and all our shows by going out to our website at thebiz.tv. Just sign up on our homepage. Well, that's the buzz on the biz for today. You've been in the zone, the business insurance zone. You're listening to the insurance industry's number one resource for products, planning ideas, carrier information, and interviews you can use. When it comes to life insurance, annuities, long-term care, disability, or group pension plans, we're the news you can use.